Welcome to Open Classroom. This is the Brown School's digital forum for bringing brilliant people together, and we are so glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Laurie McConnell. I'm communications coordinator at the Brown School, and I will introduce our panelists and other facilitators in just a moment. But I want to do uh, quickly just do a little housekeeping. We're using a webinar format. That means that we can't see or hear you, unfortunately. But we would love to know your thoughts and your questions, so please feel free to post them in the chat. We're going to have a Q&A session at the very end of our program. And so, you know, if you have questions throughout the program, just go ahead and type them in. We will collect them and ask them at the end. And don't be shy because there might be 15 other people with the same question who are also shy. So you're helping a lot of people when you ask a question. Uh, we're also streaming live right now on YouTube. I put that link in the chat. So if you have a friend who couldn't join us in this virtual room but still wants to watch it live, you can send them to the Brown School YouTube. Uh, also, I want to tease some upcoming open classroom programs that you can still get registered for. Next Tuesday, that's September 13th, we're going to have Voting is Social Work, Researchers Speak Out, a great panel of social workers who are do doing some amazing work registering voters. On Thursday, September 15th, we start a six-part open classroom series called Building a Transformative 21st Century Research Agenda. This is all about how we can listen more to people who have lived experience. Um, and that September 15th webinar is titled, If You Do Nothing Else, Please Take Time to Listen. Black Families and the Child Welfare System. It promises to be really, really fascinating. We're also going to talk about caregivers in sub-Saharan Africa, digital innovations for helping those with mental illness, so many more topics. So uh, check out the Open Classroom website and get registered for any free Open Classroom webinars you like. And now I have the privilege of introducing Cynthia Williams, Assistant Dean for Community Partnerships at the Brown School here at Washington University in St. Louis. Cynthia, thank you so much for being here and being uh, my partner in crime. Now, Cynthia and I will be collecting those questions, so you just type them into the chat and uh, we will ask those at the end. I am also really thrilled to introduce Rupong An, Associate Professor of Public Health here at the Brown School. Now, Rupong, the idea of doing open classroom webinars focused on AI, on artificial intelligence, was your brainchild, I believe. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit about why you think AI is something that we should be covering, and then you can introduce our brilliant presenter for today. Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Laurie, and nice to see everyone. So thank you all for your interest in our open classroom series on artificial intelligence in social sciences. So the series really aims to introduce AI machine deep learning uh, to a diverse group of audience, discuss the applications of AI in big data analytics, assess the use and misuse of AI in social science research and practices, and provide implications on the profound impacts of AI, both positive as well as negative on today's and future society. So we invited uh, distinguished speakers from various backgrounds, uh, including both academia and industry uh, and social and natural sciences to talk about their unique encounters and adventures with AI. So today we are so fortunate to have uh, Ms. Francisca Kirsten talking to us. So Francisca is a senior scientific domain lead at Blue Ocean Robotics, a high-tech company that develops professional service robots, primarily in healthcare, hospitality, construction, and the agriculture industry. So Francisca uh, pursued her master's degree at the University of Southern Denmark majoring in international business communication. Her unique training and uh, years of work experiences are truly interdisciplinary, encompassing robotics, AI, business, ethics, language, and communication. So last year, she visited the WashU School of Medicine, and she demonstrated her company's recent invention, the PTR robot, which is an AI-powered mobile robot for safe patient transfer and rehabilitation in the hospital setting. So now without further ado, let's welcome Francisca to offer us her talk titled Robotics, Artificial Intelligence, Ethics, and Sustainability. So Francisca, the floor is all yours. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for that really nice introduction. Um, yeah, I'm uh, going to start by sharing my screen. 
um, because I've prepared some slides for you to get some visuals also while I'm speaking. And let me see. You should be able to see my screen now. Is that correct? I'm yes, so we can. Good. Yeah, super. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, I'll give you an, an overview over my research on robotics, artificial intelligence, ethics, and sustainability in this open classroom session. And uh, the work that uh, I'm presenting today is uh, mainly based on my project funded by the NGI Explorers program that allowed me to visit uh, WashU last year, like you've just heard and uh, research on the topic of ethics AI and specifically healthcare robots because um, uh, that's one of my big interests and that's also where uh, our robots, uh, our target markets for our robots at the moment. And because it was, this project was initiated by industry, it's a bit of a mix of research and re review of industrial uh, cases and practices. Um, and uh, just uh, a little bit more about myself. I don't think there's much more to say after that uh, really nice introduction, but uh, just a little bit more. Uh, I have a, a background in social science and uh, have been working in robotics for the past 10 years in interdisciplinary teams and research projects, focusing on developing robots and introducing them in organizations. Um, uh, investigating their impact and uh, I've mainly worked there with social robots, service robots, but also robots for inspection, manufacturing and agriculture. And uh, yeah, the company I work for uh, is called Blue Ocean Robotics. Um, and we develop, produce, and sell mobile service robots. At the moment, we have uh, three robots in our portfolio, like you can see on the pictures, the UV disinfection robot, the telepresence robot Gobi, and the PTR robot, um, which was the focus of my project and which I'm gonna talk about a little bit more about here also. You're gonna uh, watch a video also to see a little bit more what it's about. Um, Blue Ocean Robotics also has a strong team in the US, so just reach out to me if you would like to get connected to them and um, uh, yeah, maybe you see our robots uh, a demo somewhere uh, that should be possible because we are also in the US. Um, but we are, uh, have our headquarters in uh, Odense in Denmark, uh, that's uh, here. Um, and uh, Odense is also called the Silicon Valley of robotics, where a lot of successful robotics companies have their origin. The most well-known are probably universal robots and mobile industrial robots that you can see on the pictures. They were also acquired by, U by a US company, Teradyne. Um, but there are many more robotics companies and also startups. It's a really good environment to um, uh, yeah, to move into with a startup or to create a startup. A lot of students are creating robotics startups there. We have a lot of uh, um, uh, robotics uh, studies also. So if you're interested, if you're watching and uh, you're interested in robotics, you want to study it or you are studying it and you're looking for an, an internship or uh, connections to companies, uh, I have put some hyperlinks in the, in the slides and you can look at them afterwards or just reach out to me. I'm always happy to help and, and make some connections. Yeah, um, about uh, my projects and uh, my, my motivation to do, to do the project and look into AI and ethics um, while working with robots. Um, the reason was because the Blue Ocean Robotics robots today are operated by humans. Um, the UV disinfection robot can navigate autonomously. Like you can see, it's uh, uh, navigating autonomously in the hallway. 
um, but only if it's told to do so by humans. Um, but uh, with the growing advances in artificial intelligence, the robots could soon interact uh, intelligently with their environment or with people and with other machines, um, communicating with them. And uh, combining AI with robotics uh, gener a generates endless new capabilities for robots. And they can communicate with each other, they can transfer knowledge, they can learn between each other. Um, and this can, can uh, increase productivity, it can make the workplace safer, it uh, can relieve human workers from tedious tasks. And uh, especially in the healthcare industry, this can balance the labor shortages that are caused by the demographic um, change. And uh, I wanted to look uh, into, um, uh, into that because uh, obviously AI uh, has a great potential and uh, in the future, we will equip our uh, robots with AI once it's uh, technically possible and uh, they can be robust out there. But uh, we also need to be prepared for that and uh, think about the ethical consequences. Um, before I go more into that, I want to quickly show you a short video so you get an impression about uh, um, about one of our robots, the PTR robot, which I think is a really interesting robot for me working in human robot interaction um, and uh, uh, is, uh, has a great potential if it is equipped with AI. So, can you play it? Work-related injuries have always been an issue in healthcare. Why is it that so many people work so hard that they get injuries? Is it commitment? Is it the fight for greater good? If we can change the way people see robotics and technology, we can aid them in this commitment. A solution to reducing work-related injuries has now been developed, the PTR robot. The PTR robot is easy to move around, even in confined spaces due to its omnidirectional wheels. Using the panel buttons, the PTR robot can expand and collapse to fit hospital and nursing home needs. The sling bar is hand controlled for maximum ease of use when attending the patient. It can be moved up and down to the right and left for the benefit of the caregiver. The touch screens give access to information and features to make everyday transfers easier and better for both the patient and the caregiver. A smart and safe solution. But how safe is it? The PTR robot has multiple safety features. To name a few, self-locking wheels, the robot cannot be pushed or moved accidentally. Obstacle detection helps prevent the robot from damaging objects. Cameras function to ensure visibility in blind angles. And with passcode safety, only authorized personnel can operate the robot. With this robot, you can transfer patients up to 250 kilos or 550 pounds from bed to wheelchair, bed to bed, bed to toilet or bath, turn patients in bed and much more with the use of only one caregiver. Because of the mobility, fallen patients can be assisted anywhere as long as the entrance is under 80 centimeters or 31 inches in width, almost every door. Using less staff to perform patient transfers will also reduce the risk of infection and increase staff efficiency. Waiting time for colleagues can be reduced significantly as the caregiver can do the patient transfer transfer single-handed. We believe that this robot will serve a great purpose in reducing work-related injuries due to less wear of staff in hospitals, nursing homes, and rehabilitation centers. With its rehabilitation features, it is able to support the rehabilitation of patients, ranging from the early mobilization to various balance and gait exercises. The robot will help create a more relaxed interaction between the caregiver and the patient, because the robot is doing all the heavy lifting so the caregiver can concentrate on the well-being of the patient. The PTR robot takes transfer to the next level. Yes. What? Yeah. Um, yes. Like you, you've seen, the PTR robot is a, is a mobile robot. Um, and uh, you could see in the 
video that it's uh, still operated by a healthcare professional, so it's uh, not acting autonomously. Um, but in the future, like I said, it could uh, support healthcare professionals through artificial intelligence and um, uh, also act more autonomously and help healthcare professionals with uh, monitoring patients or suggesting individual rehabilitation programs. And um, that can be really useful for healthcare professionals, um, as you could hear in the, in the video, to prevent injuries, but also to increase uh, quality of care for patients. Um, but uh, research, research has also shown that not necessarily every robotics developer has the time and the skills to consider possible ethical issues that occur during the development or also once the robot is in operation. So the goal of my project was to look into how um, uh, how robotics companies, in particular also Blue Ocean Robotics, to prepare us uh, uh, for the future, um, how uh, we can build up a, a best practice guide that allows us to integrate ethical reflection in our everyday practice. And for this, I researched the current trends in robotics and AI because um, I also wasn't fully up to date on, uh, on, on uh, the status of AI. It's uh, progressing so quickly. Um, and with focus on healthcare robotics. And, and then I identified common ethical issues related to those trends and uh, those mentioned concerning AI as well. And uh, came up with a best practice guide. Originally, that guide was supposed to focus on healthcare robotics companies, but it turned out that the initiatives can be applied by uh, robotics companies in general, or maybe also technology companies. So I hope it will uh, be also be helpful for you, even if you maybe don't work in a robotics company, but uh, that you get some takeaways that you can um, apply in your teamwork. Um, and especially when working with technology or developing technology. And uh, I'll uh, give an overview over all uh, three areas. The first one, the research on AI trends for healthcare and robotics. And uh, the International Organization uh, for Standardization and the um, International Federation of Robotics uh, define a service robot as a, a robot that performs useful tasks for humans or equipment, excluding industrial automation applications. Uh, service robots can be uh, outdoors or indoors. Um, here on the slide, you see mostly examples for indoors, like guidance robots or hospitality robots delivering drinks in hotels. Um, robots in the service robot industry have unique designs. They don't necessarily need to be human. Uh, on these slides, they are all look very human-like, but not all of them look, uh, look so humanoid. They have um, different degrees of autonomy um, from fully teleoperated to mostly autonomous operation or navigation. And uh, a little bit about the, the background on and the, the current um, numbers on service robots. The total number of service robots is continuously increasing and uh, medical robots account for 31% of sales value, value of service robots at the moment. And sales of medical robots have increased by 50% in 2018. So quite quite a lot in, in a short time. Uh, a big part of those medical robots is still surgery robots, but they are other robots are increasing, like you can see on the pictures, laboratory robots, um, robots for delivering medicine or transporting waste or robots for taking COVID test samples. Um, and the, 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 the increased demand for uh, service robots and healthcare applications is clearly to, due to the demographic change and the shortage of healthcare staff. 
Um, but also robotics companies have come up with new business models like, like robot as a service. And uh, that allows hospitals to trial the robot without investing too much money upfront. Um, within the um, healthcare robots, I looked at robots for rehabilitation, um, just because uh, those are the robots that are uh, very similar to the PTR robot, even though there's no robot that can handle um, the transport of patients and the transfer and the rehabilitation at the same time. Uh, but rehabilitation robots have uh, a high potential to um, be even more effective uh, with the help of AI. And that's why I looked at rehabilitation robots in specific. And these robots have been used in physical therapy, for example, for upper and lower extremities. Here you see examples for lower body rehabilitation robots. Um, like exoskeletons and uh, mobile devices. And, um, oh, that was too fast. And they can actively support patients to perform therapeutic movements in a very precise manner, uh, manner. And with that reducing the risk of injuries for both patients and healthcare professionals, and combined with sensors and AI, they could even offer more effective support. And AI and healthcare, I think you've uh, heard quite a lot already in the, in the last uh, open classroom sessions about it, but um, it can improve the sensitivity of healthcare professionals, reducing human errors and increase the quality of care. Uh, AI can support uh, uh, healthcare professionals in assessing the health risks of patients, as well as monitoring and advising patients um, during treatment. It also allows doctors to follow their patients' uh, health from, from uh, further away uh, through smart devices and phone apps. Um, what is also very interesting is computer vision-based human motion analysis that can be used for assessment of uh, physical impairments or improvements in physical therapy. And there are uh, body computer interfaces that can be combined with stimulation and that can enhance the effectiveness of rehabilitation. So if we in the future uh, equip uh, rehabilitation robots with AI and with these features. And uh, of course the trends are there, but combining robots with the technology is there's, there's still a longer way to go um, and to, uh, to make it um, ready for the real life and the real world scenarios. But if we equip uh, robots with these features in the future, they could provide general health assessment or personalized rehabilitation programs um, they can support physical therapy through gait analysis and stimulation. They can offer more diverse physical therapy with uh, digital elements like you can see on the picture. Um, and they can track patient comfort during a physical therapy session and adjust exercises accordingly. And um, this sounds very promising and uh, no doubt uh, intelligent rehabilitation robots can increase uh, patient's quality of life, but uh, they would also collect data unobtrusively and uh, have increased autonomy. And therefore robot developers need to be aware of the ethical issues, need to be able to identify them and reflect on them. And not only uh, research is concerned with, uh, um, with robot ethics, but uh, for example, even the Pope included the topic in his official prayers, highlighting the necessity of uh, balancing the advancements of technology while respecting the dignity of persons. And uh, he said, uh, artificial intelligence is at the heart of the epochal uh, change we are experiencing. 
Robotics can make a better world possible if it is joined to the common good. Indeed, if technological progress increases inequalities, it is not true progress. Future advances should be oriented towards respecting the dignity of the person and of the creation. Let us pray that the progress of robotics and artificial intelligence may always serve humankind. We could say, may it be human. And with this uh, going on to moving on to what is ethics? Um, ethics is the discipline concerned with what is morally good and uh, morally right and wrong. When applied to robotics and real life scenarios, ethics uh, often appears to be more of a problem, uh, doing something wrong or uh, an ethical dilemma, which, which sounds rather negative. But it's not necessarily about saying no to advancements or uh, spotting um, the, the wrong decisions, but identifying the good and steering into that direction. And uh, ethics in robot design focuses on being aware of ethical issues uh, to create value sensitive design and um, perform responsible research and development in robotics. Um, now, ethics in robotics can be divided into three general categories. Um, we have the ethics of the robots themselves and how they could make moral decisions and in how far we want to delegate control on moral decision making to machines. Then we have the ethics of the robot users, which is concerned with the question of how far people's behaviors towards robots needs to be regulated, especially because robots increasingly appeal to our common anthropomorphic understanding. And this is uh, not yet a discussion about robot rights, even though uh, it says on this slide. Um, but it's, it's rather about the violent behavior towards robots that feels wrong, even though we know that they are objects and that they, they can't feel anything. And uh, of course, also the fear that um, violent behavior towards objects that look like animals or humans might also become normal towards uh, animals or people. And then the last part is the ethics of the designers uh, developing and selling the robots. And that also relates to the industry, um, making the robots commercially available and also the policymakers regulating the deployment of the robots. And that's the part that I mostly focused on. Um, generally, ethical issues here can be divided in two categories. Um, the ethical issues concerning technical development and ethical issues concerning the societal impact. And I'll go a bit more into detail that now. So ethical issues related to technical development that can relate to the questions like how is data collected, what is what data is collected and where is it stored. Uh, cleaning robots or robots in shopping malls can collect uh, data about our everyday life and habits without our consent or with our consent and uh, we might not be aware of it. Um, AI needs this data, uh, ideally a high amount of data to work effectively. So um, how could a rehabilitation robot that is equipped with AI store patients' information appropriately? Um, because even if data is anonymized, it can often be tracked back. So these are questions that uh, the robot designers need to consider. And uh, robots are usually much stronger than humans and can more easily harm humans. Uh, so it's very important to provide safe and robust robots, especially when they navigate among people, for example, in open room environments like uh, shopping malls. Um, 
And uh, yeah, they need to be safe to prevent accidents, uh, either made by mistakes or on purpose, uh, for example, through hackers or uh, just children who want to see how robust uh, the, the robot is or just want to bother the robot. Um, And ethical issues related to societal impact, um, concerns, for example, unemployment. Um, there are web pages that tell you how, li how likely it is that you'll be substituted by a robot in the future. Uh, you can see that on the um, picture on the top. Um, but we will unlikely be uh, out of jobs. Jobs are, are shifting and new education or re-education is necessary and workers will need to collaborate more closely with robots, uh, which will also free up their time to focus on the more human values and capabilities. But of course, that's something that needs to be considered and uh, we need to take care of that these new educations are provided and, um, uh, and that we have capable um, people in these new educations that are necessary. For example, programming of robots, um, engineering, maintenance of robots. Uh, so computer science is growing, but this is still an area where women are underrepresented. Um, the picture below is from the 9% is not enough campaign in the UK in 2016, where only 9% of the UK's uh, engineering and technology workforce were women. Of course, that has been proved in the last years, but there's uh, uh, no uh, gender balance yet in, in this domain. And uh, that's something that robot manufacturers are uh, probably not even aware of because it's, it's not a, an ethical issue that is directly concerning them. But, but uh, diversity during the development of robots is, is really so important because otherwise the algorithms um, will be biased and uh, AI is just as smart as the data as it, that it gets. And uh, if the algorithm has been trained based on data collected by engineers, which uh, are typically young men, then how is a robot supposed to know whether an older woman is walking correctly um, because uh, her gait will be uh, very likely different, but not wrong. Um, so uh, it's, it's very important to, um, to train the models with uh, a very different um, data and being diverse in that respect. And uh, that goes also for robot development uh, and uh, how tall a robot should be or, or um, how is it approaching humans? Um, it's a, yeah, it's a very, um, very difficult to, to uh, integrate diversity and think about all the people that get possibly in contact with the robot. So the um, algorithmic um, bias playbook uh, says, if an algorithm scores two people the same, those two people should have the same basic needs, no matter the color of their skin or other sensitive attributes. We consider algorithms that fail this test to be biased. And another example you can see in the picture is from the algorithmic recommendations often used in the US criminal justice system. Uh, here we have a black woman who has predicted to be, who was predicted to be much more uh, dangerous than a white man, even though he actually is a higher risk. And these predictions are very dangerous because they, they directly concern people's life. And I think in a, in a previous uh, open classroom session, there was also the example of the uh, Amazon um, resume screener, which uh, is a bit of the same, uh, the same issue. So there are a lot of uh, these examples and um, there are also initiatives trying to fix these and um, these biases in AI. Uh, 
Uh, other ethical issues include the increase of power, which comes with the data and uh, those who have access to it. And um, also the explicability. AI is often processing data beyond our human capabilities. And uh, in that it's not very transparent. It's more of a, of a black, box, uh, black box in terms of how it reaches a decision. And uh, this is, of course, a problem if you want to build a system that humans can trust in. So healthcare professionals uh, will likely not trust the system if they don't know how it has generated the decision. And especially in healthcare, where such a decision can, can have a big impact on people's life, it's very important that uh, the end users trust the system. Uh, finally, it's also very likely that not everyone will have access to new and intelligent robots because some countries don't have the infrastructure or some hospitals don't have the financial budget to um, invest in, in such technology. And this can hinder the equal distribution of robots. And finally, uh, one more ethical issue um, that uh, I've been working a bit more with since my project ended, and I'd like to highlight here is just sustainability. Robots can support sustainability, of course. Um, they can monitor environmental health and ecosystem changes. They can uh, combat environmental disasters like forest fires or oil spills. Um, but the environmental impacts of AI and robotics should also receive more attention during the development and uh, during the design of a robot, because robots are electronic waste made of uh, rare earth met metals, and they are, at the moment, uh, a lot of them are difficult to recycle. And electronic waste is already in a common problem uh, contributing to climate change. And uh, besides the electronic waste, uh, especially large AI models need a high amount of data and computing power, which increases energy and, and water usage. Now, if intelligent uh, robots can, can have such a positive impact and uh, increase our quality of life, uh, how can we avoid all the very demotivating ethical and sustainability issues that I just pointed out. And there are overall guiding principles for uh, uh, every ethical issue um, that should be achieved when developing robots and AI. Uh, like uh, for example, technical robustness or respect for human autonomy. And uh, of course, also, all these are interlinked. Um, so we will need to add a, a linkage here. Um, uh, and uh, if I increase, for example, the safety of a robot, I might reduce the transparency and explicability of it. So um, these guiding principles, they are interconnected and they need to be constantly reviewed and uh, checked um, after each uh, change or update in, in a robot or an AI system. And uh, uh, performing or considering the, uh, the uh, these uh, guiding principles is easier said than done. Um, and that's why I've looked into what robotics companies can do to incorporate the guiding principles in their practices by looking at the following questions. Uh, why ethical reflection? Who should be involved? Uh, what needs to be considered? And how to integrate ethics practices in the everyday life? And uh, I'll give a, a short summary version of uh, of that. So why ethical reflection? Um, first and foremost, the whole company, uh, including the C-level, needs to be on board and be convinced that ethical reflection is a good idea and that it's even a good idea when, uh, when it outbalances the financial benefits. For example, when it's more expensive to refurbish a robot than manufacturing a new one, but the comedy decides to do it anyways because it's a more sustainable choice and it's according to their um, sustainability strategy. 
Um, and uh, ethical reflection in general can contribute to a fair society. And in the long run, I think uh, it will also make for a more sustainable and fair uh, business of the company, even though there might be for some financial drawbacks uh, on the way, um, they will be able to turn into financial advancements uh, afterwards. Um, after that, the whole team needs to be on board. Um, ethical reflection needs to become part of the DNA of the company, of uh, every decision of every meeting. All employees need to be able to think about the impact of a decision instead of thinking, I'm not an ethicist, so it's not my responsibility. And finally, we have the stakeholders. Uh, yeah, they need to be in the center of every decision. And for that, it's of course necessary to know who the stakeholders are directly and indirectly, and they need to be included in the development process. And most important, they, their input and the insights collected at uh, uh, stakeholders such as end users need to be considered and should not be ignored. And of course, um, when we now turn to what needs to be considered, the, um, of course, the human, human rights need to be considered when developing a robot. And the European Commission's high-level expert group on AI points out to certain human rights that are particularly important in connection with robotics and AI, um, like uh, uh, respect for human dignity, freedom of, individ of the individual, respect for democracy, justice, and the rule of law, equality, non-discrimination, and solidarity, and citizens' rights. And they also define four ethical principles uh, to ensure ethical and robust uh, robots and AI. And those are um, very similar to the guiding principles. Uh, respect for human autonomy, prevention of harm, fairness, and explicability. Now, um, in most countries, the fundamental rights and principles are enforced by regulations and standards, and they are legally binding. Um, but still, ethical reflection can help to understand how the development, the deployment, and the use of robotics and AI may impact the fundamental rights and uh, their underlying values. And in terms of sustainability, um, environmental concerns should be considered during the design phase of a robot and performed during the entire life cycle from manufacturing to end of life. And ideally, this should move robot development more towards a circular economy. So asking questions uh, before the robot is manufactured, um, but taking care of that uh, beforehand, is the material used to manufacture the robot from a sustainable resource or recycled? How great is the environmental footprint to produce the robot? And is the supply chain sustainable and fair? And uh, for the lifetime of the robot, can the robot be repaired or upgraded instead of being replaced with a new system? Is the robot an AI system powered by renewable energy and how much energy is it using? And end of life, can the robot be refurbished or recycled? And if not, how is it disposed? And finally, what needs to be considered is testing and testing and testing because it's just so important. Um, it's important to test the robot and the AI for potential ethical issues to avoid moral dilemmas. And because it's very natural that a team can't think of all the issues or situations that uh, can arise between humans and robots and in real world situations. So the robot needs to be, robots need to be tested in many, many different contexts and at different levels before entering the market throughout its life and with every new version that is uh, installed or updated on the robot.
And finally, uh, we come to how to integrate uh, ethics practices, uh, very hands-on inside the company. And um, here, I won't go uh, too much into detail on, um, uh, on what I came up with. Um, but I've attached a list of useful sources in the end of this presentation, if anyone should be interested to look out uh, more for that, or will also is interested to, to do that in, in the company uh, you work for, uh, and feel free to reach out to me. Um, these practical integration uh, of ethics practices also varies a lot, depending on the company structure and the culture. Um, but I have built my practical guide up around four pillars, which is the training and initiative, like extraordinary education for employees on ethical uh, topics, or uh, an, for example, an internal um, ethics forum uh, that discusses potential uh, ethical issues that uh, are collected in the company once a month or um, or shares experiences on how um, on ethical reflection uh, from from the team uh, and then as I mentioned before the C level needs to be actively uh, driving and engaging an ethically led strategy um, they really need to be part of it as well. And uh, also it needs to be part of the roadmap of the internal KPIs. And finally, those need to be assessed and the impact needs to be assessed continuously. And also that should be taking place by um, external auditors so that you have a neutral person coming in and um, checking on uh, how you have uh, implemented your ethics strategy. And um, maybe a, a more uncommon um, approach to, um, uh, yeah, to integrate ethics practices is meditation. And uh, it's a methodology that goes into my first pillar that I just mentioned, training and internal initiatives. And I just wanted to mention it here because uh, I remember it was also named in uh, one of the previous open classrooms in AI session last November, um, where I was also surprised that, uh, uh, that it was mentioned there. And I also just read about it because uh, before I hadn't heard about uh, meditation in a company context. Um, but there is scientific evidence that meditative practices can have a positive impact on companies' performance and on society. Uh, because individuals who meditate tend to change the way they frame a problem and they usually become more long-term oriented, uh, which I think is, is a very interesting approach towards uh, integrating behavior change. And um, at least I haven't heard about it uh, uh, and I haven't heard any company doing that thus far. So um, I would be very interested in hearing if uh, someone has experiences with that and um, or uh, some, some stories that they can share. Yeah, and um, in the end, uh, we need to remember that change is, is not performed overnight and implementing ethical reflection is, uh, is about behavior change of everyone in the company. Um, every person, even though it's a company commercializing the robots, every person involved in the creation and deployment um, of the robots and the AI, is accountable for considering the system's impact and reflecting on the ethical issues. And with that, I uh, want to thank you and um, looking forward for the discussion. And um, I have added my email address here. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions, if um, 
you're interested in robotics and would like to hear more. Yeah. Francisca, thank you. That was fascinating. And uh, if you have any questions at all and you would like to ask them to Francisca, this is your chance. So go ahead and type them into chat and uh, Cynthia and I will collect those and ask them. And uh, Rupang, we're gonna let you be the first one to ask a question. <laughs> yeah, sure. I appreciate it. And thank you so much, Francisca, for yeah, you know, sure. providing such an insightful uh, and, and profound discussion and talk. Um, so I, you really provided us a lot of food for thoughts. Uh, so you know I have a million questions for you, uh, but I'll just ask one uh, for now. So um, no, we know now our human beings, we tend to attach our feelings and emotions and behaviors to non-human subjects, no matter it's a pet or an object, a non-living thing. Uh, so we just have this kind of uh, emotional attachment uh, and intention uh, to associate our feeling with non-living uh, or objects. So, um, and consider the, the vast potential of robots, especially family robots uh, that can be built a human-like and really attracting human to attach their emotions. In this case, uh, it is a violation of human, uh, say, human autonomy. And should the company put a, a warning message, say, no, this is a robot, it has no feeling, so you should not invest your feeling to the robot. Uh, I know this is a very complicated question, but I think it's forthcoming uh, probably in the next years or so. Uh, so mm -hmm. I want to hear about your insights on that. Yes, yes. Um... Yeah, we in in our company, we haven't thought about it because we, we don't have those humans, uh, those robots that are, are like you're saying, integrated or potentially integrated in a family situation. But still, we have also experienced or I have experienced in my projects where I introduced robots, for example, in elderly homes or in hospitals that once they give the robot a name and uh, they uh, put some stickers on it or maybe a face, uh, if it doesn't look human, uh, they accept it much more easy, easily and uh, it integrates much better into their everyday life and uh, into their work. Um, I, I'm not sure whether there should be uh, a message. Um, I do think with some robots, uh, there should be, I'm not sure whether it is a message or whether the robot in the future uh, should recognize itself that this is, this is getting too close. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that could be a good option. I had a very interesting project that's a little while ago with a social robot. You could see the, the picture on one of the slides where I talked a bit about my background, um, where I worked with social robots um, and uh, children with um, uh, that had issues concentrating in school and um, finding friends because because of uh, of this um, and uh, uh, and they uh, really got close with with that social robot, talking to the social robot every day until the teacher said, okay, now uh, you, need to, you need to go and play with your friends because the robot is, is not your real friend. We need to really time this and see the robot as a tool because in the end it is a tool. It's not, uh, it's not a friend, it's not, um, it's not a family member. Uh, it's, it's, it's a tool for education, um, for uh, healthcare and, and yeah, various applications. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Cynthia, did you have a question that you would like to share? Uh, well, sure. I, I shared the sentiment um, that this is an interesting, fascinating, but it's also very scary, the information that's being put forward. So Based on my uh, influence in, from being a citizen of the United States, the question that I want to raise is my reflection is I'm looking at the terms lifespan, lifetime, end of life, robot rights, all of it 
before this presentation, I would not have been as sensitive as I now am. And I find it fascinating that those terms are applied to an inanimate object. That's the first reflection. So my question is centered around also your considerations, the consideration for human rights. But as you know, human rights and civil rights are not the same. So when, when the development of the protocols and the ethics and the morals for this field, will, do you foresee civil rights being infused into consideration? <laughs> uh, can you give an example of uh, what you were thinking about? Well, as you know, civil rights generally come about because some group or groups have been discriminated against based on uh, race or gender, et cetera. So uh, I saw in your list of considerations, human rights, but knowing that there are differences, we have to incorporate civil rights to make sure that we are aware of the inequities that human bring, beings bring to a process. In particular, a majority, no matter where the majority is. So yeah, is, is that clearer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think definitely. Um, but yeah, the, the robot and the algorithm is, is just as good as the human behind it. So it's, I mean, it's, very, very difficult, I think, to, to evaluate that and see um, who is, um, who is uh, yeah, uh, in charge there or um, how that could be um, evaluated uh, concerning civil rights. So it's, yeah. It's difficult. Yeah, I, I was fascinated with this, with your talk about biased algorithms. And I remember the first time I heard about like a camera that couldn't pick up on different skin tones. That yeah. shocked me. And I realized this is, it's not intentional. It's just when exactly. you get the same yeah. group of people doing the work, then yeah. you're going to get one result. And I loved the thing you said about every time you make a change, test, test, test again which is yeah. great advice, not just for people in robotics, but for people in every field, is that yeah. whenever you make one little change, you might inadvertently have made a, an enormous change and you need to go back and do yeah. some testing. That was super valuable. Intentional, that was the word I was searching for. Uh, it's, uh, and exactly like you're saying, it's, uh, it's so difficult to spot um, and, uh, and to, to actually see that there is a bias and that there there is a problem because you you won't really see it un unless you have the mass or the the tests obvious. But a person like you're saying, just going to the doctor and being evaluated on the skin tone might just not notice that the person has been evaluated in the wrong way uh, and probably not intentionally um, because the AI doesn't know and the human behind the AI probably also didn't know. So uh, it, it will be very difficult to evaluate that and, um, and take a decision also who is, um, who, who is liable for that. And we did have someone say, I, I would think immediately it would be under the umbrella of ADA. Um, I'm not, I, I'm assuming that's American Disabilities Act, but I could be, forgive me um, if, I, if I'm if i wrong, but do you know what, I guess we can ask what kind of legal um, protections there are. Oh, yes, I did get it right. Thank you. Um, so oh, are, I'm sure this is not true. Are laws keeping up with, the, with robotics, with AI? Slowly, and uh, I actually think that was covered also in the last uh, open classroom session. Uh, Rupeng, I think you uh, you touched upon that as well, where you had the slide on um, what are uh, the national um, regulations or um, uh, yeah uh, towards AI, and um, 
I think that's different in every country, but um, there are also recently uh, joint um, initiatives towards uh, um, towards more global um, uh, global regulations and agreements on ethics of artificial intelligence. Uh, for example, UNESCO they have. Uh, uh, just adopted the, the first global agreement uh, last year on uh, ethics of artificial intelligence. And even though that is, um, that is very similar to, to robots and ethics, um, we cannot be sure whether it will be the same if you combine artificial intelligence and robotics. Um, but at the moment, it's focusing on the ethics of artificial intelligence. And that would also apply for when you equip a robot with artificial intelligence. Well, I hate this. We've gotten two fantastic questions, but we are so late on time. So I think the best thing for people to do is um, we are uh, uh, we are going to share Francisca's slides on the Open Classroom website. I will put that link in the chat right now. And there is contact information for you if you would be willing, Francisca, to to communicate with people, with students who are very interested in these ideas of policy and, and ethics, and also just the, the pure science of it and how to balance all of them, we would be super grateful for that. I wish we had another hour. Everyone is sending you applause <laughs> and thank you, Francisca. And let me just mention There's that- Really you, nice comments also. I yes. Don, yes. <laughs> we have some brilliant people out there, but uh, also you did this not in your native language and in the middle of the night. It's yes. 1.30 in the morning where you are. I can't I can't finish 2.30 now. Yeah. 2 now. <laughs> I can't finish a sentence in my own language in my own time zone. So I don't know how you did this. We are so incredibly grateful to you. Please visit the Open Classroom website if you would like to watch this again. We will record it and have it posted in about 72 hours. We will also have her slides on that website as well. Uh, Francisca, thank you so much. You are brilliant and so generous with your time. Rupong, we are so grateful to you for bringing us this series and creating all of these wonderful questions and many, many answers. Cynthia, you always have brilliant uh, analysis and questions. I'm so lucky to be on the screen with all three of you. I thank all of you for attending. We really appreciate this. We do this for you. So thank you for being here. Please tell your friends that they can find the webinar online in a couple of days. And if you liked this and you would like to register for more, visit that same link. We appreciate you. We hope you have a great day. Stay safe and well, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Francisca, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.